be here today with you guys, with fellow cypherpunks and crypto anarchists. And it's really apropos that I'm here talking about these ideas. Indeed, that we're all here talking about these ideas in a land where they had a velvet revolution, where they had a peaceful revolution, a kind of satagraha, to use Gandhi's terms, peaceful resistance. One of my favorite thinkers of the cyber, of the, a writer of the cyberpunk genre, William Gibson. You guys familiar with William Gibson by show of hands? William Gibson had this really interesting quote from his eighth book, Pattern Recognition. He said, the future is there staring back at us, trying to make sense of the fiction that we will have become. This is a quote that I quote often because it's really unsettling to me on a fundamental level. It's the idea that if we don't somehow figure out how to change our ways or change our direction, then the future is void, non-existent. In the context of the crypto ecosystem, cryptocurrency and all of our efforts become a shell of their former self. They become a husk of their former self. And the reason being, and why I titled this talk A Return to Cypherpunk Values, because I think the greater crypto community at large has indeed lost its way. What Pavel said is absolutely correct. The idea of trying to fight for greater freedoms, for human rights, for civil liberties, for understanding what Timothy May talked about when he wrote the Crypto Anarchist Manifesto, what Eric Hughes talked about when he wrote the cypherpunk manifesto. Those ideas have indeed been lost on a lot of people. So I don't want to be a complete negative Nancy. We're going to really get into these, the problem space, and then we're going to get into the solution space. So the first thing we're going to discuss today, number one is, what is the actual problem? Why we need to, because I'm really preaching to the choir here, right? You guys, I don't think it's going to be controversial to say that we need a return to cypherpunk values. But the idea is, how do we communicate that? How do we get more people involved with our passion, with our drive, with our desire to actually create meaningful change? So the first part is discussing this idea of, of crypto and the ecosystem turning into a casino, right? And then in the solution section, we're going to discuss a bit about how can we get more people involved, especially developers and engineers, and even just those interested in the values that we appreciate in order to help change things, to create a paradigm shift. So that's one, looking at the looking at DarkFi's idea of a dark forest infrastructure and the development of infrastructure that suits our needs. And then the third part, I'm going to get into this idea that I've been mewling over for some time and I've written a little bit, bit about called uh, the polypunk thesis, which is this idea that we have a consilience of knowledge. We bring our knowledge together with those who disagree with us. So we try to unite and unify to figure out the path forward. So let's think about this first part, the crypto casino. Again, I don't think it's controversial for me to say that there are a ton of people in the crypto community where their whole focus is zoomed in on when number go up, when moon, when Lambo. And what Pavel said is absolutely 100% correct. I think the Bitcoin community, specifically the Bitcoin ecosystem, is extremely guilty of this as of late. And I think a lot of that is driven by propaganda. It's driven by a newly formed indoctrination around the institutionalization of Bitcoin. And to echo what Amir said in one of his talks, the discourse is weak. There's no coherent narrative that actually moves us forward toward human rights. I'll tell you guys a little story. I was online on, on X on Twitter the other day. Actually, it was probably a little bit longer ago now. I was having a discussion with this, this gentleman or someone on Twitter, and they were saying that I, I was making a case for anonymity and privacy and the, port, the importance of our values. And they said, why are you worried about that? Why does that matter at all? What you should be worried about, what sh you should care about is your purchasing power. So you should care about when number go up. And listen, I actually come from a background of anarcho-capitalism, of voluntarism. I don't think there's anything wrong at all with making money, 
with accumulating wealth and having that matter for our push toward freedom. But I don't think having a strict focus on those ideas is helping us, helping move us forward. And I actually made the case to this person that what good does having all the money in the world do you if you end up at the end of the day lock, locked in a cage, right? Locked in a government box. Because if the men with guns really want you locked in a cage or locked, locked in a box, that's where you're going to be. So we have to we have to help these individuals. We have to help the community see the importance of returning to cypherpunk values, of returning to our MO, to our modus operandi for developing and creating anonymity enhancing and privacy enhancing technologies. It's just absolutely so important. So again, let's not dwell on that too much. Preaching to the choir, you guys all agree with me, I'm pretty sure. Uh, but I, there is, there is, <laughs> <laughs> there is something that does bear mentioning before we move on to the next section that I did mention I wanted to talk a bit about the Bitcoin ecosystem. I want to pick on those guys a little bit. So Pavel is right. There's been the ETFs recently that have emerged, which represents the institutionalization of crypto, specifically of Bitcoin. Uh, you, you hear everyone always quoting Michael Saylor and his ideas that it's not even cash for the world anymore. It's not even peer-to-peer -peer money. It is, he's saying specifically, it's digital gold. That's what Bitcoin is, although that is that runs contrary-wise to the Bitcoin white paper, which the idea was peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash. Again, I won't dive too deeply into this, but it's very clear. And Roger wrote about it in his book recently published called Hijacking Bitcoin. This idea that crypto is moving toward more institutionalization and commercial, commercialization and away from the cypherpunk ideas is a of it's a tremendous problem and we have to be able to fight back against it. So let's get into that. Let's discuss that. I really love the idea that that Dark Fi, Amir and his team have talked about of erecting a dark forest canopy. This idea where cyber gorillas can get enmeshed in this dark forest environment and then they can build the tools and the tech to help fight back against the system. Now, what's interesting about this, though, this, this concept of, of dark forest is it also inspires people to get involved in our space and to build things for the defense of human rights without fear and concern and trembling and shuddering because it's a really nasty situation that we're in. So what's happening effectively, why I think a lot of people are more interested, especially some developers of developing these, these uh, shit coins, they're interested in developing things that don't matter things that ultimately don't drive and inspirit and inspire and push a person forward is because of this notion of the chilling effect. You guys are familiar with the chilling effect, right? So whenever, whenever a, a government starts going after people like it has, whenever people start getting locked up, whenever an industry is targeted, it creates a chilling effect where communication is frozen. But I think all of us have this idea also that code is law, right? Code is speech. But if there's no one to write that code, if there's no one to create that algorithmic law, then, then we're losing, we're not able to move forward. So I think having this, this desperately needed infrastructure, this dark forest infrastructure developed is going to be key for us to be able to push forward and to create the future and to build the, the things that we want to build and to get more people involved. So I think that's the first step. And I want to take a minute to tell you a little story of how the surveillance state kind of emerged, but it's also a cautionary tale that plays back into this larger narrative. So who here is familiar with Mary, Queen of Scots? Okay, there's a few people, probably you've seen my talk, I've talked about her in past talks. So Mary, Queen of Scots was a contender for the English throne in the 16th century. She was arrested for trying to foment a rebellion against the crown. She was a devout Catholic, and Elizabeth was on the throne, and she was a, a Protestant. So Mary was arrested. She was accused of potentially trying to overthrow Elizabeth and take over the crown. They didn't have enough evidence to do anything to her right away, so she was in prison for 10 plus years in London. What happened, though, this is where the story gets really interesting, is that Mary was actually an astute cryptographer. So she would 
write these letters and she would in, encrypt them. She would use what's called a, a Caesar cipher or a substitution, substitution shift cipher, uh, also called a nomenclator. And she would, she would use these ciphers in her missives and she would send them out. She would put them in the, the bunghole of those giant beer kegs. But what happened is she ended up getting set up by Elizabeth. Elizabeth knew that she was sending these messages out. And what Mary didn't know, what really ended up hurting her, is that Elizabeth had a intelligence community, community at her disposal. She had a very extensive, extensive surveillance apparatus at her employ. She had everything from henchmen to spies to prodigious code breakers. One of the code breakers in her employ was a, an individual named Gregory Philippe. And Philippe was a, a man of intense intellect. And he would receive her letters, right? Elizabeth men would, would take her letters and give them to Philippe, and he would take time, and he would use a technique called frequency analysis to decipher Mary's letters, and he was able to do that quite well. And what happened is she had sent a letter out to one of her compatriots, uh, Anthony Babington, I believe is his name, and the letter... Uh, plain as day said that she had intended to overthrow Elizabeth and have her murdered so that she could take the crown. So while she was in jail, she was trying to start this rebellion, and now they had evidence in this deciphered letter. So you can imagine that it did not end well for her, and it didn't. She was tried in court with the evidence of her 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 letter, the, the cracked code, right? And she was beheaded, right? She was, she was killed for attempting to overthrow the state. Now, what's, what's interesting about this story is it created a situation where all the governments in Europe started to adopt similar surveillance apparatuses in the Middle Ages. It, it was called a chamber noir, right? That's the French term for it, chamber noir. And it, we would just refer to it as a black chamber. And a little bit more history, this spread throughout Europe but then in the U.S., in the early days of the National Security Agency, the NSA, a lot of people don't know that it was called the Cipher Bureau at the beginning of its days. And its nickname was actually the Black Chamber, right? So this is how the surveillance state actually emerged in the Middle Ages. And then all of this activity, all of this, this surveillance apparatus now really paints a picture of of where we're at and how we got here, but it also acts as a, a cautionary tale. If we don't have ways to protect ourselves and protect our encrypted activities and technologies, if they're not actually encrypted, then we're actually losing the fight. And we can, you guys, we can see this, particularly with the rise of blockchain forensics firms in the modern day where a Bitcoin is a solar punk technology that's fully transparent. They don't even need to decrypt anything. They can just go and look at the look at the chain using techniques called clustering analysis and these, these different things that blockchain forensic, forensics companies use. So yes, that's some more nastiness and some more collective brutality and it's the, the badness of where we're at. So how do we continue to, we have the dark forest infrastructure, so how do we continue to convince more people to get involved with our ideas, to, to align with our train of thought? One of the ideas that I've been considering, I mentioned to you at the intro, is this notion of the polypunk thesis. So one of the things I've talked about for many years is trying to figure out how we can work together, how we can leverage things like empathy and compassion. How can we try to connect with people to get them to come over and join with us for, this, for the greater good of pushing freedom, human rights, and spreading this technology to as many people as possible. So in polypunk, of course, we take the lunar punk notion, right, which is uh, typically a more pessimistic idea. It, we automatically question the technology we put out. We, we scrutinize it ourselves. We, we get concerned of whether it's going to be surveillable. We also don't get great network effects as a result of that. It, it, oftentimes, we don't see a lot of mass adoption. Uh, Monero is one of the great things that has seen a bit more adoption, but still compared to the network effects of Bitcoin, compared to the optimism that solar punk tends to engender, we kind of lose, we kind of lose pace. So how can we, and I would make the case that certainly there are some good attributes of solar punk tech. It's still quote unquote punk, 
although we really loathe the transparent aspects of it for obvious reasons, how can we take that optimism? How can we take that desire to create network effects, that mindset, how can we push it forward? So what we have to do is have a consilience of knowledge. We have to have a unity of knowledge. We have to see how we can bring these things together and push them forward for people to adopt and to embrace and to appreciate and to ultimately love. So that's the idea that's been going through my head. And I think that if we're unable to make these connections, if we're not able to, to generate this kind of concern and, and appreciation for what we're doing, then we, we get less and less people to come over to our, to our side and to our aid. And I think really we, this is what we need to push forward. And it's difficult, right? Because a lot of times we wanna argue and we wanna debate and we wanna get really upset with it, even like I did with the guy, right? And I think that's fine, we should do that, but we should also do what we can to try to connect with people. And that's what I do every time when I go out and then I talk to them about this idea is we can work together to build the future, to create the things we wanna create for that freer crypto human rights defense that we're trying to foment. I think that's a really, a really beautiful thing. So, okay, so I have three minutes left. At the end of the day, what we're building is absolutely amazing and we're trying, we're doing everything that we can to defend ourselves in a very hostile and adversarial environment. And as a result of that, it's caused, I think, again, a lot of us to, to flee the ecosystem. It's caused, we're all here at these conferences trying to figure out a path forward. So I think we, we, we maintain the optimism. We work together to build this stuff out and what we ultimately come up to, and this is what we're trying to do at, at Logos, what we, the ultimate outcome of all of this, and this is how I see us pushing into the future, is this, the apotheosis and the idea of building a network state, right? Or building a, an autonomous political formation. This was a vision of dark fi as well, because we take the lunar punk mindset, we take the solar punk mindset, and we develop these novel governance mechanisms, these novel governance models, and we assert these for a freer future. We're able to basically exit through the technology, and I can think of no greater and more beautiful future than that, but there's a lot more to discuss as it concerns uh, network states and autonomous political formations. I don't have all the time for that, but the point is, if we develop the infrastructure needed, if we develop the dark forest infrastructure, the dark forest networks, the canopy to protect the cyber gorillas, and we come together and we try to communicate these ideas in the most effective way that we can to people, then we're on the correct path to exiting the system through technology, to building a freer future, to combining our intelligence, our ideas, our strength and our skill to push for that freer future. And you know what? I think certainly the, the future is, is bright, but it is also dark with the stirrings of the lunar punk imagination and ethos and i think we have to return to these lunar punk values we have to get other people to see them and i think people like timothy may eric hughes and all the early cypherpunks would be very appreciative of that david chom as well who just spoke in amsterdam i think it's a beautiful goal and an amazing vision and if we can't find the way forward i don't think the way forward can be found and it's going to be all of us in this room who are able to do it and able to push forward with such gusto so just a couple of things. I think that's going to be nearing the end of my talk. I've actually brought some books. I only have a few left after I, I sold the rest of them. So if you guys are interested in some of these ideas, especially around the uh, communication ethos I've talked about, I've discussed that and I've built out those ideas in, in long form as well. So appreciate your time very much.